patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. All right, let's open up in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this opportunity to open up your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this, uh, the privilege to be able to gather and, and, and to worship you, Lord, even in our, uh, our, our flaws and failures, Lord, that you, uh, you, you, you crave for us to be a part of that uh, relationship with you, Lord. You, you, you seek us out, Lord, and we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy towards us, despite our failures and our faults, Lord. Just thank you for your goodness. And I pray as we uh, open up your word today, just open up our hearts and minds so we're ready to receive what you'd have for us and help us to see, uh, see where we may need to be improving and growing and, and letting your work happen in us. And we thank you for this time together. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. So here we see in Hebrew, and I was, uh, sorry, before we get started, I would say it's been a, a very interesting outside week, outside, this, uh, outside of church when you think about the election and all that's going on. So it's nice to be able to gather, have some time to... Let those distractions go for a bit. So um, as we think about this lesson today, just, just don't think about anything that's going on out there. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1, uh, we looked at this, this beginning of this passage, and he talks there, this is Paul, or we believe is uh, the speaker here, talking about this race that's set before us. And he paints a picture of running, and he paints the idea of these witnesses that were sur surrounded by, that were compassed about um, by these, these witnesses. And he says there what? Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This Christian life is a, is a, is a race, right? It's a, it's a long race. It's not a sprint, hopefully. It's a marathon. And so for us, he says there what? Run with patience. And as we look at the, the, this lesson today, I want you to keep that in mind. He's talking about this, this patient run, this patient race. And how do we run that race patiently? What's he say there? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There's a focus of our race. And he gives a reminder in that last verse. Verse 3 says what? For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We think about who Christ was. How, what, what kind of life did Christ live? What kind of life did he live? Perfect. A perfect life, right? He did everything right. He treated everybody right. He never cheated anybody, never did anything wrong to anybody, didn't say um, anything sideways to anybody, and yet what happened to him? He was persecuted. He, what did he say there? He says he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And this is a reminder that says, you know, we're going to face trials in our life. But what's he say there? Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You know, there's a, there, we see the end, we see the focus, we have a hope that's in Christ. And he reminds us that we, we need to continue to keep Christ in our minds. He's, he's our reward at the end of this. Uh, that relationship is, is what we should be focused on. So as we think about falling forward, it, it, the first aspect of this is we need to understand holiness. So to understand holiness, it's easy sometimes for us to understand what it's not. And what it's not is self-righteousness. We think about what the word holiness is. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we see that uh, in verse 34, actually in verse 23, Jesus is speaking. It says, The same day came unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and rise up seed unto his brother. Now there with, with us seven brethren in the first, and then he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, and likewise the second, and they go forth. And basically what they're asking him in verse 28, uh, whose wife is he, or is she? And they're asking him a, a question about uh, kind of earthly law, and, and, and how does that apply? And, and Christ answers them. In verse 33, it says, And the multitude heard this, and they were astonished at his doctrine. And then came along the Pharisees, it says, when the Pharisees had heard that he had, what he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, in verse 36, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And I know we've talked a lot about these, this passage here, and I thought it was interesting. When we talk about self-righteousness, this is the context that God gives, or Christ gives towards the, uh, the Pharisees. We would consider the Pharisees as, as pretty self-righteous people, right? Like that's what they, 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 they were known as. They were proud about their, their keeping of the law. They were proud about, um, you know, that they, they weren't like the, the, the sinner, the, the publican. They were, they, were, they were better than that because they followed the law. And so here this lawyer comes and tries to, to, to catch him. He says, tempting Jesus. Um, and asks him a question about what's the greatest commandment. What does God say? Or what does Christ say? Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor, right? And he says what? These two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And he says there, and then he goes down, they ask him another question about who is, who is Christ? Um, or Christ asks him, who is, who is Christ? And they say the son of David, and he talks about that. But it's interesting, down in, in chapter 23, he says, Jesus spake to the multitudes and to his disciples. So you can imagine here, here's the Sadducees, they came along and tried to catch Christ in a, in a question. Um, and they, he silences them. And, the, and the, while, they're, he's, while they're, he's talking there, the, the Pharisees have come up and they see him silence the Sadducees. And the Pharisees are like, okay, we can do better. We know, the, we know the religious law. So we're going to ask him a religious question about the law. And Jesus silences the Pharisees. And then he comes to chapter 23 and he turns to his disciples. And he, he starts going, he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, and there, therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that whatsoever and do and do not uh, ye after their works, for they say and do not. What's he saying there? He's saying, you know what? The Sadducees tell you to do a lot of stuff, or the Pharisees, sorry, tell you to do a lot of stuff, observe stuff, and you do it. But he says what? And do not after their works, for they say and do not. He says they, they, they speak a good game. That's kind of how we would say today. They speak a good game, but they don't actually do what they say. It says, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they land on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do uh, for to be seen of men. They make broad their uh, phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And these are the ideas, those things, the things that they would wear to show, uh, that would hold Scripture. And they, would make, they would make a show of their, 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 their carrying of the Scripture. They would make a show of their garments that would recognize their piety. He says, And love the upper, uppermost rooms of the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And ye shall, and, and ye, all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for there is no, there, well, one is your father which is in heaven. Neither ye be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he shall, shall be humbled himself shall be exalted. So this is the message he gives to his, his, his disciples here. And he says, look, don't be like the Pharisees. What are they trying to do? What's he talk about? Give, give me a summary. What, what are they described as? Everything was for show. It's for show. What did he say? They do it to be seen of men. Verse 5. But the works they do for to be seen of men. They wanted to be seen as these spiritual leaders. They wanted the opportunities um, to, to be in the, uh, the chief seats, um, in the front of the synagogue. But he says what? Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. When we talk about holiness, I want you to keep this context in mind. Not only does he talk about the law, what's the greatest part of the law, but he talks about that humbleness and how we serve. In verse 13, we're not going to read all of these, but he, then he goes into some woes. And he starts putting warnings against the Pharisees. In verse 13, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. It says, Woe unto the scribes and Pharisees. In verse 15, And hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he hath made, you made two more fold the children of hell than yourselves. Verse 16, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, is he a debtor. Verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have done and yet uh, and, and not to leave the other undone. 
Verse 25, Woe unto scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the house of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, can, uh, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. In verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if, I had been, if, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been the partakers of them with the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, be ye witnesses of yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? You hear this idea of the Pharisees. Well, we, from an outside perspective, as, as, as the men that they were trying to impress, would we consider the Pharisees pretty spiritual people? If we were to see the way they lived their life, we'd say, man, they're really spiritually mature. Look how they walk, all the stuff they do. Man, there's nothing, you know, they don't do anything wrong. They do everything right, right? They, do, they, they give tithes, they, 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 they speak the right thing, they know the scriptures. I mean, if I ask them a question, they'd be able to tell me all about the scriptures, right? But what's it, how does Christ describe them? What's he say at the very end? Verse 33, serpents, generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? He says they were dead on the inside. They had all these great, uh, they looked great on the outside. And I lay this as kind of the foundation as we talk about this idea of holiness and self-righteousness because I think it sets a context. We can easily be Pharisees. Because what's he say there? He calls them Pharisees and hypocrites. The idea that, our soul, that, that we, may, we may walk a really good walk on the outside. People see us every day and say, man, that's, that's a spiritual Christian there. That's a person that I want to be like. But what's he say there? They are dead and empty inside. Uh, we said there, he says there, you're full of dead men's bones. Outwardly you appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Ver Matthew 15, we won't turn there, but he says, you hypocrites, well, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What's he warning there? He says, what, what, what can we be guilty of? Teaching the doctrines, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We got to be careful that we aren't the ones who are teaching doctrines and saying, this, or teaching our own ideas and saying, this is doctrine. This is what God hath said. Ye shall not do this. And we've added to the scriptures. What's he say there? They're speaking with their mouths and honoring me with their lips. May sound good, may sound good for what we think of what Christ would expect of us, but he says what? Their hearts are far from me. The idea of self-righteousness. What does self-righteousness do? First, it minimizes God and the work of his spirit. What is self-righteousness? What were the Pharisees? Describe self-righteousness to me. What were the Pharisees doing? They were focused on doing, actually. Isn't that the problem? They were focused on doing. I'm going to do these things so I can impress God. I can be what God wants me to be. But what were they missing? Letting God work in their hearts. Being what God wanted to be in their hearts. Um, so if we, if we are self-righteous, we are minimizing the work of God and His Spirit uh, in us. It minimizes grace. If I can be as good as God wants me to be, why do I need grace? Do I need grace if I can do all the stuff that God wants me to do? No. It minimizes grace. It places our evaluation, our evaluation ahead of God's. So if I say, look, I'm doing everything that, God, that the Bible says I'm supposed to be doing, so I must be doing what God wants me to do. What is, am I, how do I know that? What did, David, what did David say? We looked at this a few weeks ago. Search me, O God, and know me. Uh, show, he wanted God to show him his heart, if there be any wicked way in him. He wanted to see it. As if our evaluation can be placed ahead of God's. If we have self-righteousness, it also focuses where? Externally. It focuses on what others, others see, how we live. Um, it's the idea of being an actor, right? It's, it's what Rachel and I have talked about before. It's funny how we, we celebrate people that lie to us. That's what an actor is, right? That's what their job is to do. They're paid to make us believe something else. 
and we celebrate them. This is the idea when we think of self-righteousness. They're, they're, we're playing the part. So we've got to be careful with our self-righteousness that we're not focused externally. It fosters compartmentalization and rationalization. You know what that means? Those are a couple of big words. It's the idea that we separate our spiritual lives from our other lives. We separate, we rationalize and say, well, I'm not so bad over here, but I, you know, that's not so great, but I'm not so bad over here. Self-righteousness says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving tithes. I'm giving to the church. Uh, I'm showing up on Sundays, but I'm not, uh, I might not give over here. Or I might not care over here the way I should. And it's okay, because I'm already doing this over here. Self-righteousness removes the Holy Spirit's work and holy living. What, where does our growth come from? Can I grow myself as a believer? No, if I, if I think, once I start thinking I can do good stuff and I can, I can grow my faith of my own, I forget the whole work of the Holy Spirit. So we think of self-righteousness. That's what it's not when we talk about holiness. So let's talk about Christ-likeness. This is what it is. 1 Peter chapter, four, or chapter 1. Y'all can turn there if you like. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 14, he says, actually in verse 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance, but, that, but as he which hath called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. He says there was at the very beginning, what are we supposed to do? Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you in the, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The idea that as believers, what? We, we should be holy. The end, the end result of that is we should be holy. And how do we do that? How do we do that? We change, we've seen it in Revelation, uh, sorry, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, or 2. What are we supposed to do? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Verse uh, 13 here says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation. The idea, just like we talk about that race, and running the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, our finisher, what is our, where's our focus supposed to be in our Christian, law, Christian walk? That finish line, that race, the, the one that's run the race before us. Uh, he says there the idea that we're supposed to be sober and hope to the end. Not fashioning yourselves according to your former lust and your ignorance, but he which hath called you is holy. You know, we can, just as the Pharisees, the Pharisees fashioned their righteousness after their own desires. You think about that. They, they didn't just fashion their righteousness after what the gospel said. Why, did they, why were they righteous? What did Christ say? Why were they righteous? To be seen of men. That was their own desire. They were doing the, all these things so that they could be uh, to fulfill their own desires, not the desires of Christ. We see that the, the holiness comes in three different ways. And we've talked about this when we talk about the work of, of God in us. We see that there's first internal holiness. You know, we're changed when we're saved. We've looked at this uh, when we talked about the new birth. There are our spiritual DNA changes. Uh, we, are, we are a new creature, he says, free from the penalty of sin. Why is that? Who's paid the penalty? Jesus Christ has paid the penalty. He's paid the penalty for us. There, we have internal holiness. We're, we are working towards external holiness, free from the power of sin. This is the work of Christ in us. So now that we don't have the penalty of sin in us, he's working through us to create us externally holy. But that's not us doing it, right? I can be external. This is what the Pharisees were doing. They were being externally holy. They were trying to be free from the power of sin, but still under the penalty. They were, they were trying to free themselves from sin and say, look, see, I can do it. I can be holy. But the reality was they couldn't. They could never be holy because, it was, what did he call it? They were dead men's bones inside. You see, we're alive. We're born again. We have a life within us, a spiritual life within us that's different. Um, that allows us that work to happen in us so that we can be externally holy. And ultimately, we're looking for is eternal holiness. That's freedom from the presence of sin. That's the, that's the second coming of Christ. That's us being in the presence of God himself, where we can be free from the presence of sin. 
So we see the, the work of holiness is, is, is threefold. So when we talk about just when we talk about the idea of being saved, right? There's three aspects to being saved. We're saved immediately. That's, that's our rebirth. We're saved um, as he works in us and he transforms us. And then we, we're saved ultimately when he comes again and he, and he calls us to himself. The idea that his, his, his holiness works in us, is a, it's, a, it's a progression. So how do we measure that progression? How do we measure maturity? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, if you want to turn there, we're just a few chapters over. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I think... He says there in verse 12, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that combine them, or commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. For we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measures, though we reached un- reach not unto you. For we have come as far as you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we will be enlarged by you according to your rule abundantly. He's talking here, he says, this is the idea of Paul talking about the Corinthians saying, we're not boasting that we've, we've come unto you because of anything we've done, but because God has allowed us to come unto you. And what's he say there in verse 12? He says, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are what? Not wise. As believers, when we think about measuring our maturity, we don't measure our maturity by each other, right? My maturity isn't based upon uh, my wife's maturity or, uh, or anybody else's maturity in here. Why? We all, came to, we all came to Christ at different places, right? We all came to Christ and his work in us is different. Our choices to surrender to him are different. We may be in the same church. We may be even in the same family in the same church. Um, we talked about this before. You have, you have a set of twins, right? They're going to grow up differently. They're going to make choices that are differently. There's something that's different about, even though their genetics may be completely the same. As believers, we have all the same genetics, spiritual genetics, right? We have all the same foundation. We're all born again under Christ. But the work in each other is going to be different. What God expects of each of us is, is, is going to, his work in us is going to be different. I, I have two children, right? I treat my children, I try to treat them the same. But my work with them is going to be different, right? How I respond and react, because I expect different things of my children. Um, my son has a hard time understanding this sometimes because there's only two years between them. And he's like, why, does, why do I got to do all this other stuff? I said, because you're two years older. In two years, your sister will be doing that stuff. Um, and we, we compare ourselves as spiritual among ourselves. What's going to happen? First, what's going to happen to us? We're going to think, either we're going to think we're too much of ourselves, right? Or we're going to get defeated because, oh, I'm not like Brother Robert there. Or I'm not like Brother Charlie. Man, they're spiritual. Or, man, I'm, I'm so much better than Brother Dwayne. I'm good. You know, we're going we're gonna to start comparing ourselves, and we're going to have a false understanding of who we are. And then what's going to happen between us? What's going to be created? It's going to cause friction, right? I'm, gonna be, I'm, I'm not going to want to be around so-and-so because you know, Brother Willie, he's so spirit. I don't want to be around him. I feel convicted every time I'm around him you know, because I'm not as mature as he is. So we got to be careful that our comparing of our maturity doesn't create, uh, we've heard this, I know, lesson after lesson, this is kind of a recurring theme we've heard through our growth, spiritual growth in this, but we've got to be careful that we don't start comparing ourselves. He says there, it's not wise. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The idea that of, of our growth, of our development, where should we find glory? And what Christ has done in us. Once I start, I start taking the glory for what I'm doing in Christ, he loses glory. He, the glory is not on him. It says, I should glory in the cross, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also know uh, that we're, we're not to compare each other. He says in Romans 14, 4, it says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. 
I think of, um, you know, if you, if, in the workplace, I've got to be careful that I don't judge another employee uh, by my own standards. Um, I, as a manager, I have, I have expectations for my team and how my team operates and what my team does. But I got to be careful. I don't keep, I don't transfer those expectations to somebody else because that other manager may not have the same expectations. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, how are you to, how are you to judge how I'm working with someone here and over here? You may not know all that's going on. Uh, imagine if, if God is doing a work in our hearts, is that a visible place or an invisible place? Is our heart, do you see my heart today? You can hear about it, you can see evidence of it, but the work that God does in my heart is a very invisible place. How he corrects me and speaks to me and talks to me, that's a very invisible place. So how can you be able to come along and say, well, God's not, you're not, you're not doing what God wants you to do. That's God's work in me. So when he talk, that's what he's talking about there. How do you judge someone other, another person? He has to stand before that master. What God's work is doing in me is different than he's doing in you. Uh, but he, we know we all have the same goal, right? We have all the same direction of, of growing and becoming more like Christ. James 4.12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? It's interesting. We want to hold each other up to the law. Is it wrong to have rules and expectations and, and standards? No, it's not. But if I start making those law, then I start saying, well, you, know, you can't be a Christian if, that doesn't, if you don't do this, this, and this. What's he say there? Who's the lawgiver? Who gave us this law? Oops. Who gave us this law? God. So when we start to become the lawgiver and say, well, Brother Bryson, you know, I just, he, doesn't, he doesn't measure up to my standards of what a good Christian is. What have I just become? I become judge. I become God. I've put my place in God, uh, in the place of God, because now I'm judging somebody else in, in their faith. Does that mean that there shouldn't be evidence or signs of faith in others? No, we should see signs of faith in others. And against James, we know James hits on that. He says what? Faith without works is what? Is dead. You know that faith and works. But when I, if I am in the role that I'm supposed to be the one that's saying you are in the law or out of law because of your works, that's, he's, I'm putting myself in God, in God's place. Can I, be a, can I convict and encourage? Can I extort? Can I, can, I rebu- can I rebuke? Yes. I can encourage and say, look, man, this is not, this is not wise. This is not good. God, this is what God has taught me about what you should do or about what I, what I, how, I, how we should act in this situation. But that doesn't mean that I can be that judge, the one that determines salvation. Why? Because that puts me in the place of the lawgiver. You see, maturity is based on faithfulness. Faithfulness is the success. Uh, the author of this series, uh, Mr. Smith, says he's more interested in what he is doing in me than what I am doing for him. We think of the idea of the potter and the clay. Is the potter concerned about what, how the clay is helping him in his life? No. The potter, the clay should be the one that's concerned, whether I'm turning out to be like the pot that the potter wants me to be. The idea this year that he's more interested in what he, God is more interested in what he's doing in me than what I am doing for him. He wants to see that work and that change for us to become more like him. He's not worried about whether I'm, I'm doing more today than I was yesterday. He's worried about whether he's doing more in me or I'm allowing him to do more work in me. It's the idea of the greatest, uh, he also says, the greatest danger in the Christian journey are idolatry and defection, lesser loves or giving up. We think about this life of, 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 of faith, uh, what's, what we saw it in Romans chapter 12, or sorry, in Hebrews chapter 12. He says what? Run this race is set before you, laying aside the sin that so easily besets you. Uh, let us run this race with what? With patience. He's talking about faithfulness, patience. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, the success here is not the idea that we're, we're going to like just breeze by all the troubles. Or we're just going to take it easy and just walk, walk our way through this life. What's he say? That the success here is faithfulness. Success is not giving up in the race. It's not, it's not uh, saying, you know what, you know, I could be racing, uh, but I'm going to go take a break over here. We go like uh, we did a um, half marathon once for a boss's day. I think I shared this before, um, and it was a, we did it as an office. We said we're going to do this for our boss because our boss was a triathlete. And we said, you know what? He he doesn't really want stuff, but he'd like to see us do something together. So let's go do a, a half marathon because that's what you do. You start out like 
It's not the full marathon, but it's a half marathon. It's only 13 miles. Um, so that's nothing, right? Um, so we said, we're going to do this half marathon. So we all started doing it. We all started, we got training plans out like eight, nine months ahead of time. We started, okay, let's do a couple weeks. Uh, let's get ready. Some folks got in there and uh, we joked because one guy made it. He, he's the one that came up with the idea. And uh, somehow he beat us all. He made it to the finish line before anybody else. And we found out he made it one mile twisted his ankle in his brand new shoes he bought the day before, twisted his ankle and got a ride to the end uh, by the paramedics and he walked across the finish line. And so, so he got a medal and everything. It looked like he finished. But this is the idea of the Christian journey. There's no shortcuts, right? There's no way to get to the end without finishing the race. Uh, we joked, we said, yeah, he, he can go hang out at the Waffle House, you know, on, on, while we're out there running 13 miles for two, two and a half hours. Um, he, he's going to go hang out at the Waffle House. There's no, no choosing to go for our lesser love. We're in this race to finish. We're in this race. There's no giving up. Uh, the idea that as, as believers, that's what, that's what God is asking of us, to keep ourselves focused on him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. What, what's, what's the concern of idolatry here? What's he worried about? Our love going somewhere else. Our love and our focus. Be, he's not worried about our actions. He's worried about our love. Because if our love is focused on him, our actions will follow. Uh, Jude chapter, or verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Again, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep yourselves in the love of God. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt also save thyself and them that hear thee. He says what? He doesn't say doing the doctrine, but what's he say? Keeping the doctrine. Take heed unto it, unto the doctrine, continuing in the doctrine. We're like, what's that doctrine mean? He's talking about the things, the, 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 the understanding of the gospel, understanding of, who, of God's love for us, the walk that he's called us to be involved in. He says, for doing that, thou shalt do what? Save thyself and them that hear thee. It's interesting. We talked earlier about if I'm in a self-righteous mood and I'm comparing myself with others, what's going to happen between us? It's going to create friction. But if I'm in a focused walk with Christ and I'm, working on, I'm letting Christ work through me, what's going to happen between us? There's gonna, what does he say there? Thou shalt save thyself and those that hear thee. If my focus is not on myself, but on God, the, the, the interaction between, I'll pick on me and Brother Bryson, me and Brother Bryson aren't going to be in, in conflict anymore because we're, we're competing for, for God's attention. We're going to be in coordination and cooperation because we're, we're both loving God. We're both working to love God. We're going to save ourselves and those around us. So we think of this idea of God doesn't call us to, to, to do things, to, to, to be a certain way. He calls us to love him. He calls us to walk in the ways that he's asked us to walk. So let's talk about falling forward in that race. When we're running, and we're, we're focused on him. We're thinking about him. I, we, I, we ran that race, that half marathon. That was my first time doing something that big. where you, you, They had 10,000 people running, and they sit you in sections of, of uh, take a big boulevard, and they take sections of the boulevard, and you get your section that you're in, and you're with... Uh, you know, 2,000 people in your section and they start them in waves of people. And running that, there's thousands of people around you. You know what? As I'm going, I'm not, I was definitely not in the front section. I can tell you that. I was about two-thirds back. And as I'm going, I start seeing the, the front runners finishing, coming back, on the, coming back the other way on the last stretch to finish. And when you're running in that space with all those people around you, you realize how small you really are. You realize, I'm not, I'm not here to compete. Who am I competing against at that point? Who am I competing against? Myself, my own best. It's not about whether I'm going to win or not. It's about whether I'm going to finish and whether I'm going to do my best. So I was focused on that finish line. And so we think about falling forward. The idea that is the, walk, the run that Christ has called us to, to run is not about whether I'm going to beat somebody else and maybe be the first one at the finish line because who's the finisher of our faith? Christ has already won. He's already finished. We've already seen him go by. We're just, we're just running the race because we, we've, we've committed to that race. And we've been called to that race. Go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 2. There are times in our lives where we will be running that race. We will fall forward or we will fall 
Revelation chapter 2, we won't read all of verse 1. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things uh, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which, which are evil. And thou hast tried them which, they are, uh, the, the, which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And has borne and ha, has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake uh, has labored and hath not has not fainted. What's he say there? He says, "I know your works." He says, "You know they're, they're working hard." He knows they're patient. He says, "What he, they 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 discern? Uh, they have discernment. They can tell whether they're uh, whether it's somebody that's evil or not. They can discern whether someone comes in saying preaching a gospel, say whether it's the gospel or not." He says what? He says, thou has borne and has patience. He says twice, you have patience. You're working patiently. For my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Then he says what? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou have left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove the candlesticks out of this place, except thou repent. But, thou, but this thou hast, that thou which thou hatest, the deeds of uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh uh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. <clears throat> the idea here, he says what? You, you've been patient. You've been working patiently. You've been doing the right things. You've been you've been looking at the God. You know the doctrines. You've been separating people out that aren't uh, that aren't preaching the gospel. He says you're finding them liars and correcting that. He says you're working patiently, but what are you missing? What were they missing? Their love. They they were doing stuff. They were busy doing stuff patiently. He says, but what you you have you've left your first love. But it's interesting here. What does he ask of us? If we've left our first love, if we've been, if we realize, hey, look, I've been doing all this stuff, or maybe I realize I haven't been doing enough, or I've been doing stuff and I'm doing it out of the right, wrong heart. What's he ask of us? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove the candlesticks out of this place, except thou repent. It's interesting. He doesn't ask us here, go do more stuff. He doesn't ask us here to go work harder. He doesn't ask us to say, he doesn't say, look, you've lost your first love. You need to go back and you need to uh, work five times more. Or you need to go, uh, go do some uh, uh, penance for me and make some atonement for me. No, what's he say? Remember where thou art, whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works. You see, if we fall in this race, if we're going to fall forward, we've got to remember where we came from. First, or 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He says that first. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. As a, as a believer, going, uh, I'll also add in here, I didn't copy it in here, but 2 Peter chapter 2, we looked at this a couple weeks ago as well. Second Peter chapter 2, he talks about our growth. And he says, if we're not growing and we're not remembering, working out our, our faith, what's going to happen? You will forget where you've come from or forget where you've fallen. He says, wherefore, rather give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For an instrument shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Chapter 1 and verse 11. Into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. It says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, knowing uh, though ye know them, and ye establish them in the present. Yea, I think it meet that as long as I put them in the tabernacle... So I, I'm going too far. Oh, sorry, verse 9. Oh, I jumped too soon. Uh, it says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You see, if I'm walking in self-righteousness, or I'm running in self-righteousness, what am I forgetting? We talked about this before. What am I forgetting? What's the foundation? What's the thing that, that we all have in common? What's he say there in verse 9? The sec we were all saved. We're purged from our what? Old sins. We're all sinners. So we remember, he says, I right, fought a good fight. I've kept, I finished my faith. I've kept, or I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Paul remembers what? He was a sinner. 
He didn't, he didn't run the race of his own. He did what? He kept the faith. Uh, he says, remember there with whence thou art fallen. He's talking about remember where you came from. Remember that you're a sinner saved by grace. Uh, that we're running this race. Uh, sometimes we, we focus on the destination of our journey. And we forget where we started in that journey. Uh, what it was like in that journey. And the struggles that we had. And, and, the, and the things that God has carried us through. So we think about the idea. What does he ask us to do? He says, what? Remember where you came from. If we want to do a check on our spiritual maturity, where do we start? Where do we start? We start at salvation. How, how spiritually mature were you before salvation? You think about that? How spiritually mature were you before salvation? Not at all, right? It didn't exist. You couldn't be. So we think about, where, remember where you came from. He's talking about remember where you were before you were saved. Uh, remember where you were. He says that, so if you've lost your first love, you want to go back to your love. If I want to, if I want to remember, uh, why do we have anniversaries for married couples? What is the anniversary a reminder of? The day you got married, the wedding day, right? It's taking you back to remember. Remember that day where you made that commitment, where you made that decision? That's what salvation is. It's reminding us, remember that day where you were not saved and then you became saved? Like that's, remember that love, that moment of that day? It was a married couple. You talk about those days. Oh, I remember the first time I saw you. Oh, I remember that first time I looked into your eyes. That's, that's the idea of that love, that care. Uh, I remember that first day. I remember when you said, I do. That's what he's talking about. Remember that day. Remember, that, remember where you've come from so that you know that that's, that's, that's where your maturity begins. That's where your love begins. We also need to remember that God has ordained this struggle. What does that mean? God knows that we're going to go through this struggle. He didn't just know it. He planned it, right? When he planned salvation, he didn't plan just to take us up and take us out of here. He planned for us to be in this struggle, to grow, to become more like him. Ephesians chapter 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As a believer, and I'm thinking of the, the spiritual maturity, and he wants us to take us back to our first love. But he also reminds us what? Let me go back. He reminds us and he says what? Remember from where you are fallen and repent and do, your, do, those fir, do the first works. He's reminding us that there's a struggle here that we're supposed to be in. We're supposed to be in this struggle. That this struggle was, uh, he says what? We, he knows that we're reborn internally, but we're still in this flesh. I was thinking, you, you've ever seen the, uh, the uh, eco challenge folks? The, the, it's supposed to be the world's toughest race. They pick an island. I saw one, it was, I think it was in Fiji where they were doing it. And this island that's this mountainous terrain and they take these folks through like this, this like, this, I mean, if you've seen kind of these amazing race kind of things, it's, it's, it's that but worse. Like you're going to go down this hill, you're going to climb up this, um, or bike up a muddy mountain where the bikes probably won't even go. You've got to do it. It's 24 hours. There's no stopping for three days. You know, it's a race that's a struggle. And that's the idea when I thought about this, this verse where he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles. The idea that in this struggle that we're in, God has given, he's, he's done what? He's given us two things that says there, finally, my brethren, what? Be strong in the Lord and what? The power of his might. He says there, what? Put on what? The whole armor of who? God. He's given us all the equipment. He's given us the strength and the equipment to get through this race. I think of these eco, uh, eco racers, whatever they call them. The idea that they, you know, they may have equipment. So they may they may come out with the you know, the armor idea, but they're fighting their own of their own strength. You know, folks, they, they work as a team to try to get there. But the idea here is that we we don't just have a team of, of believers. Who do we have as our strength in the struggle? To be strong in the in the Lord and the power of His might. You see, the walk that we have, this, this, if we're going to fall forward, we've got to remember that when we fall, who are we falling into the arms of? Who's going to help us get back up? It's his might, right? It's his, it's his work in us. It's not my own. It's not me falling and, and just trying to work my way back up. It's him picking us back up and putting us back on the path. That this, 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 this uh, struggle is ordained. 
Um, as my kids, you think of, uh, I keep going back to kids because it's, uh, the, I imagine us as children in Christ. As kids, uh, if, a, if a kid's trying to learn how to walk, if I don't let them touch, if I don't ever let them fall, how do they learn to get back up? You think about that? If I'm a parent, I'm not going to let them fall near the steps. Like there's some boundaries I'm going to protect and I'm going to put them in safe places. You know, but I'm also, if, I'm not, if I catch them every time they start to toddle, you know, and I catch them every time, they're not going to learn to balance. They're not going to learn to, to get back up, how to lift their head up and all those things. So as a, as a believer, God wants us to work and struggle through those things so that we can be stronger in him, that he can, he can, his might can work through us. So we think about this, 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 this struggle that we're in and the falling, uh, that, that, that he's the one that's working in us. We also remember that there is no more condemnation. In Revelation, where he says, remember where you've come from and repent. Is he talking about repenting of what? Then aren't we saved? Isn't he talking to believers? Is he talking about repenting of their sins? No, he's talking about repenting of where they're at. He says, go back to where you were. Go back, turn your, what's repenting? And we really talk about what is repenting. What's the physical act of repenting? Going from one direction to the other. Stop turning and focus on your, 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 your work that you're so busy in and turn and look to who? Look to Christ. He says, repent of the work that you're doing. Focus on Christ. The idea that well, there's no more condemnation in that, right? Christ has is, is redeemed us. Romans chapter 8, there is now no more condemnation in them which are in Jesus Christ, who walk not in the flesh, but, it, but after the Spirit. Uh, and 1 John 3 says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. See, it's easy for us to kind of get in this self, uh, self-pity self, and, and, and beat ourselves up because we, we struggle or because we fall. But what's he say there? We talked about this before. Our DNA has changed. Our, our, we are, we are new, a new creature. There's no condemnation now. It says, our heart, it says what? For if your heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. He says, don't, don't sit there in your sorrow. Focus on, uh, get back up. This is the idea of focusing on, on what he's already done for us. Be reminded of that love that he has for us and the things that, he's, that he, he has already um, demonstrated in our, in our lives. And lastly, I think this is lastly, uh, remember that this struggle serves a purpose. The struggle serves a purpose. It is not a try, and this is the author, it is not a try harder thing. It is a trust deeper, yield greater thing. You do not win, I do not win by, uh, win by, by uh, sorry, it should be by, setting up rules or restrictions or by renewing self-effort. You win by repenting and returning to the first love. That's, a, that's what we see in Revelation. He says, you know, it doesn't say just, just repent. He says what? Come back to your first love. He says, this is the difference between gospel and religion. What does religion expect of us? If you fail, what do you need to do? Try harder. Come back. Show some penance. Show, show that you feel bad. What does gospel do? What does the gospel do? There's nothing I can do, right? It's all about my heart towards him. We uh, took a, um, the Yorktown uh, schooner cruise um, and they were, we, it was really windy. Uh, we did a couple uh, last week. And, uh, you know, schooners to sail ships. And t- it was really windy, and they were going to, and into the wind. If you've ever sailed or seen someone sail into the wind, there's a couple ways you can do it, right? You can try to go straight in the wind, but how far are you going to get? Not going to get very far, right? How, how far are you going to, so what do you have to do? You have to tack. You have to go back and forth. That's what these ships are, these ships are doing. They're going back and forth. And they're, they're, they're working, struggling into the wind. And we think about this as believers in our lives. Sometimes we think, well, God just expects me to get there, right? He just expects me to do. And sometimes we work really hard at doing and not focused on how we need to maneuver or how we need to focus or where we need to focus. And if we just focus on doing and, and forget about, you know, I would say there's a, um, there's a love of sailing, I guess, you have to have to be able to tack and to, and to really spend the time and patience of turning and working the sails. And the idea that if we're going we're gonna to get there, we can't just go right into the wind and expect, expect us to get, uh, to get anywhere. 
We're really going to work, or we're going to uh, spend time with Christ. It's going to take us loving Him first, spending time loving Him, following the direction that He's given us uh, and, and guidance that He's given us in this struggle. If I do it of my own self, it's not going to work. I think of this last, last example. I couldn't, I'll tell you a reason why I showed this picture, but uh, the idea that if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I was, the author talks about the idea that is. Believers, if we try to hide our sin, the idea of repenting and coming back, if we try to hide our sin, it's not going to be, um, we're, we're not, we're, it's not going to help anybody. And I was thinking, we, Rachel and I were talking, I couldn't find a good picture of our kids um, being deceitful um, or given that fate. You ever seen those kids that have like trashed the place or the dog, they do dog shaming, the dog has trashed the place and they take a picture of their dog to make them feel bad. Well, I don't have one of those, this is the closest I had. But the idea is that as your child does um, uh, mischievous stuff, you know, if, if they try to hide it, they try to just say, oh, it's, they just keep it inside. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong. You didn't see anything here. How does that help? Does that help them grow? If we try to hide our sin, try to hide our struggles? No, it doesn't. It doesn't does it help the parent correct the behavior or, improve, or instruct on the behavior? No, it doesn't. So we think about this idea as, as believers. Why do we try to hide our, sin, our struggles and hide our sin and hide our, the areas where we're weak to Christ? He wants us to be more like him. He wants us to grow in him and trust and, and, and rely in him. So it takes us, if we're going to fall forward, it takes us being open and honest about our struggles. It takes us open and honest about the areas of our life that, um, that we're holding back. Uh, I can't become more like Christ. It says there, if, I li- if, you live in the sp- if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. How do I walk in the Spirit? Which we looked at it earlier. How do I walk in the Spirit? I walk in love. I walk in a, a focused on my first love. Back in uh, Matthew chapter, five, or chapter 22, uh, 23, he, what did he tell the Pharisees? What's the greatest law? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and love thy neighbor. The idea that if we're going to fall forward, we've got to have our love focused on the right thing. Not on the things of, not on my own self-righteousness, not on the things of this earth, but our, our love has to be focused on Christ and who he is in our life. Any questions or thoughts as we wrap up? All right, so I think we've got two more lessons. Uh, we'll wrap this series up. There is um, some handouts for the next, uh, for the first lesson of the next series, a couple weeks from now, uh, or next couple lessons if you need those. Um, but that'll be, we should be right after Thanksgiving. We'll start those. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to open up your word, Lord, and just to be reminded of your grace and your care for us as a as our as our Lord and, and, and Father and just your care for us that um, to see us grow and become more like you. I just thank you for your your patience with us, Lord, and your your love for us and the example that you've given us of how we uh, of, of how we can be like you. And I pray, Lord, that you just help us today as we open uh, have the services. Help us to be an encouragement to each other. Help us to put aside any of our self righteousness, Lord, and and be and, and be able to see others saved, Lord, because of our love for you, our care for you. Uh, and Lord, help us to put you as our first love, and make sure that there's there's no other uh, no other no other things or people competing for that, Lord. Help us put you at the first place in our life. And Lord, we thank you for this. Uh, the body of believers here and the encouragement that we get from them. Lord, I pray you just help us to be, continue to be encouragement and continue to be a light for you. Uh, we thank you for, in all things in Jesus' name. Amen.